Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined by Adam Bly, who is a church decreed expert on religious demonology and exorcism for the Pittsburgh Diocese. He has helped train exorcists for over 15 years and has attended hundreds of solemn exorcisms. His journey started in brainwave research and psychology and is now focused on the spiritual realities of miracles, angels, demons, and possessions. He is also the author of several books, including The Exorcism Files. With Adam Bly, we go inside the pages of The History of Exorcism, published by Sophia Institute Press. Adam, thank you so much for joining me. Sure, Chris. It's great to be back with you. I'm very grateful for the history of exorcism. I think it's an important work. I think it's one of those things that needs to be brought out in the light because people have a lot of different ideas about what exorcism is, but also uh, maybe not an appreciation of its role in the life, not only of the church, but even before that. And you bring that forward so clearly. So thank you so much. The history is all there, so I really didn't do a whole lot except try to put it together and maybe synthesize it a little bit. But I found it to be a really interesting story, which is why I wanted to to get it out to people in the form of a book. Because, yeah, as you said, most people really have no idea where this came from. They've just kind of seen the movies. You know, they have their ideas from there, which which is really distorted. Obviously, Hollywood doesn't know much about this. So, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping it'll kind of demystify it a little bit and and also, it had some interesting twists in the road through the history of this. So it's kind of a neat story, I thought. And I'm not saying that about like my own book. I'm saying that the, the history of it is just, it's a neat history. Well, I'll say it for your book. It is a neat book. I found it fascinating. And I think context is everything, isn't it? So to understand something more fully, you need to be able to put things into context, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you do. And hopefully it'll help not only with the idea of solemn exorcism, but the whole deliverance world. It kind of puts the whole range of prayers in a context because it shows back when it was more of a gray area and prayer was just prayer and, you know, deliverance and exorcism weren't well defined in the early church in terms of where the lines were between them. So, I hope it'll lead people to understand why exorcism is is really a qualitatively different thing than just deliverance prayers. How did you become involved in the ministry that that helps to free people from a, a captivity that the church wants to be able to offer them? Well, it's a long story, but it's um, about 15 or 16 or 17 years ago, I was doing graduate work in adult clinical psychology and mainly brainwave research. And I was curious whether any of these strange experiences were real or if they were an artifact of the brain or mental illness. And so I started looking into it, stumbled across a possessed person early on. It wasn't like anything I had seen clinically or been trained for clinically. The interventions that you would do in psychology for psychosis had no impact. And that led to, you know, obviously questions. And then as I got to meet specialist clergy and got drawn into this, and saw full-blown cases of solemn exorcisms, I started seeing things that you can't explain. And so once I realized it's a real phenomenon, it's a real spiritual reality, I then decided to basically, as long as God was willing, dedicate my life to it because there were so few exorcists around at that time, you know, 20-some, well, about 17 years ago. The ministry really, you know, it had faded out. It was almost gone. And so we've been working, you know, as a community for a lot of years, and now there's a lot of exorcists trained up in the United States, you know, a few hundred at least, and there's more every year. So things are really kind of rolling at this point. Well, the really good news about that is, it, as you said in the past, maybe 15 years or so, institutes have developed, and one that I'm more uh, familiar with is the Pope Leo the Thirteenth Institute right. that is established by priests. And also their 
particular teams, which include practitioners as you are, someone who is not only devout in his faith, but somebody who has an understanding of the human person, which can help them to provide their ministry. And, and that's an important thing, isn't it? Yeah. And it's good to to mention, of course, I'm a lay person. I'm not a priest. I don't actually do exorcisms. Only a priest with permission from the bishop can do that. But God seems to have called me into a kind of unique role of training and teaching and essentially coaching priests and particularly new exorcists. So the best way to learn is kind of in the situation. So I do teach at the Leo Institute, and I've taught at other national conferences for years and things like that. But really, the at the end of the day, you, you have to do it and kind of be mentored by other exorcists and people with experience, basically. And just wanted to be clear so people don't make the mistake of assuming I'm an exorcist. I know from the founders of the Pope Leo the Thirteenth Institute, I, I know Monsignor John Essop very well, mm -hmm. and that the hope was that this could, once again, have this freedom for those souls who have found themselves in the situation where they need this help, that you do need to have that order that comes provided through the father and the and the bishops mm -hmm. and the priests that have been assigned to be able to deal with an enemy that is so much smarter than we are, right? Well, they are smarter than us, but the more important thing to remember is that Jesus is in charge and he limits what they can do. He limits what they know. He puts limits on, yeah, just everything about their existence. And so, you know, instead of Yes, they're smarter than us, but God is obviously knows everything. And so if you're doing, you know, legitimate ministry for Jesus that he's called you to, he's going to provide, you know, the protection and the insights, and he's going to shut down what they're doing to the extent that he wishes to, to help the church, you know, say these prayers for people and get them freed. So I just want, I'm just encouraging you, like, yes, they are smarter than us, but Jesus is smarter than them by a long shot, right? He's God. So we don't really need to be anxious about the fact that they're smarter than us. Amen. Amen. That's why it's so important, the work that you've done to show that the church has a response to this. And even though it's taken years, especially in our time, to once again tap into those graces that come from the sacramental experience that is offered us fully in the church, mm -hmm. that in many ways, the work of, again, Pope Leo XIII and other institutes that have been legitimately established, it's because there has been deliverance ministries that have flowed out of what maybe was happening from charismatic experiences. Right. And the church said, hey, there's something better here, and we need to really once again claim that. Is that a fair way of saying that? I wouldn't say that it's better. I would say that it's necessary. So the stuff that came out of the charismatic world and, and still goes on in the charismatic world, when it's real and legitimate charisms of the Holy Spirit functioning, which in the early church, that's part of what would go on for possessed people. But it's critical that we understand that it wasn't the average everyday Catholic in the ancient church that was doing exorcisms. It wasn't the college student. It wasn't the married person. It was ascetics, people that were living kind of, you know, fairly radical spiritual lives that were in an advanced spiritual state, basically living saints. Those were the lay people that were doing exorcisms by charism in the early church. It wasn't just the average person, you know, at a prayer meeting kind of thing. But all that being said, Jesus can do whatever he wants, and he does, if he wishes, give that charism or, I think, a better way to think about it. He may respond to the charitable prayers of a person who isn't a priest and they're not doing an exorcism, but they're essentially asking him to free somebody. He sometimes responds to those prayers because, he, again, he can do whatever he wishes. And if a prayer is from the heart, it moves God to respond. So what I would say, though, is that it's not that it's better, but when it comes to full-blown possession, it's necessary. And the church figured that out over the centuries, that it's a qualitatively different situation. It's not saying like, oh, this is minor league versus major league. It's like this is baseball versus football. It's a completely different situation 
when a person is possessed versus somebody who's just being heavily tempted or maybe oppressed, the church saw this is a different phenomenon and it requires a different intervention. And so, you know, that's why the church limits the use of solemn exorcism. It can only be used if there's possession. And so I don't mean to, to ramble on about that, but it's not a kind of a competition or any kind of enmity between kind of the charismatic world and the exorcism world. They both have their place in terms of prayer. I think the times that it can get difficult is when people involved in the charismatic world encounter people that are actually possessed and continue to pray and start speaking to the demon and rebuking it and things like that. And that crosses the line that then Cardinal Ratzinger, in his 1986 letter to the world from the CDF, so it's an authoritative letter, warned the lay people that they're not to speak to demons. So that's all just to say it's not better, but it's different and it's necessary. We'll return to Inside the Pages in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to Inside the Pages. We're talking to Adam Bly about his book, The History of Exorcism. Thank you for fleshing that out more, because I think it is important to realize that, especially with the graces that we receive from the sacraments, that this is actually for our protection in a very real way as lay people or anyone who may get involved in this particular type of ministry, because Mm -hmm. the, the danger can become if you don't have the balance and the order and having a really healthy, established team with you, there's a lot of things that you can be sucked into or succumb to, as it were, that you may not be prepared for. Mm-hmm. And it's, the slide begins with pride. And yeah. you may not realize it, but once that door is open, a whole bunch of other doors open up. Yeah. It helps to have people with, with experience around, especially in your early years, to at least have somebody to call and check in with because, yes, it is a cunning enemy. They've been manipulating humans for thousands of years. They're good at it, and they know us well. They know our our weak spots, and so they will try to take advantage of that. And one weak spot is when you're a beginner. They know you're a beginner. They're going to see if they can just simply scare you away. If they can put on a good enough show, some people just will never come back. You know, that is one of the things that they'll, they'll try to do in the beginning. And having somebody with experience who isn't phased by that is, is really helpful. 
Well, Adam, you talked about they've been doing this for thousands of years, and in your book, The History of Exorcism, you go back to even the ancient Near East. You talk about yeah. how exorcism has been a part of the story of man, actually from the very beginning, hasn't it? I mean, with that first temptation. Well, sure. You know, and I guess, you know, I've never thought about it this way, but you could think of the expulsion from the garden as a kind of exorcism against the devil who had been allowed to intrude. Obviously, God knew he was there and allowed the temptation because he allows us to be tempted so we can use our free will. But then, you know, he, he was expelled and Adam and Eve were expelled. That's an interesting point. But yes, it's a universal problem. These problems of these spirits, it's been around as far back as human writing goes. So if you go back to ancient Sumer with the Sumerians, which is basically as far back as we can go with uh, written civilization, they had a strong understanding of spirits and they blamed, now they, I think they made errors. They blamed most ailments, most physical illnesses on spirits. And they probably would have blamed mental illnesses on spirits too. But they, you know, almost certainly were encountering genuine spiritual cases also. And they had their own versions of exorcisms, even, you know, in those days. So every culture has tried to find a way to deal with these problems because it is a universal human problem. You know, I I thought there was a segment in that particular section of the book that talks about the exorcism, say in the Old Testament, that even the Psalms are used, the, the song of evil spirits that you record in the, the Talmud, and even the the ones that we may not realize that we say are potentially in our songs at the Mass and here at right. the Mass, like Psalm 91. Right. Yeah, there was originally four of the Psalms that were very specifically directed at driving demons away from a person or or the singer themselves. And of course, we know, you know from the Bible stories that David was able to exercise King Saul, at least to some extent, through his songs. And so that's, you know, where that kind of tradition comes from. And then as you move forward into the ancient church that's still retained in the Orthodox Church today, their exorcisms are almost completely comprised of the Psalms. Now, we also use a lot of the Psalms in the Roman ritual for exorcism, but the idea of the Psalms being kind of central to exorcism is part of the church's perspective for a long, long time. That experience with the scriptures, the power of the sacred word, I've experienced myself when I need to draw upon it, I think, the power of the the prologue of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, that just by receiving that word once again and praying with that, it has an incredible power, doesn't it? Yeah, the prologue to John is, in the old exorcism rite, is the first gospel reading. So every time you go through the exorcism, that's the first gospel reading that you hear. And of course, it's delivered to the demon. You know, it's a reminder for the demon of the fact that everything was created by, through, and for Jesus. And it's a reminder to them that they're merely a creature, which of course they know that, but a lot of the prayers are there to remind them of their place versus the lies that they're telling about what they are. That's very important for us to remember. As you rightly brought forward that exorcism, especially the, the, what we understand as the solemn exorcism, is used in many cases for, or is it primarily just in the cases of possession, not oppression or obsession, which are in themselves right. a torture for many, but primarily used for possessions, correct? It is only used for possession. So the solemn exorcism, by its rubric, meaning its instructions at the beginning of it, and the prenotandra, which is the introductory uh, instructions and notes to the exorcist, that is used, it is spelled out there, it's only used for possession, and you have to prove that there's possession by documenting some of the signs of possession before you can go to the bishop and ask for his permission to then continue with the solemn rite. And so, though people want to have the drama of a solemn exorcism, when they're oppressed, or even if they're just imagining they're oppressed, if they're mentally ill, they'll often call and say, well, I need an exorcism. I'm hearing this voice. It just cannot be done. So yes, it is It is strictly limited to only cases of full possession. That's an important role that you play in helping the priest be able to discern, not just to make a decision, but to also to discern in the, with the help of grace whether this person 
is in need of that solemn exorcism. Yeah, but you know, it isn't so much discernment because when, when we use that word, a lot of people then in their mind, they go to the fact that, oh, you've got some special spiritual sense and you just know whether somebody's possessed or not. Most people are thinking that when we use that word. So it's not really a discernment. It is more objective facts. So when it comes to possession, the signs of possession are knowledge of all languages, knowing hidden and secret things the person couldn't know, detecting the holy, and then strength beyond their condition in life. You could say supernatural strength, but that's technically the wrong word, but basically incredible strength. So you wouldn't so much be discerning it, you would be proving through interrogation in various languages whether what is speaking out of the person knows all the ancient languages and all the current languages. Now, you, you know, you're not going to have every language represented in the room, but we've had cases where there's five different languages amongst all the people in the room, and the person speaks only English, uh, as an example. So you then record these facts, and you go to the bishop, and you say, here's the facts of what we've documented in this case. Will you approve the solemn exorcism? So it's not the exorcist who's deciding you're possessed and we can use the solemn rite. It's actually the bishop. But the exorcist is responsible to gather the data to present it to the bishop for his decision. We'll continue with part two of our conversation in our next episode. With Adam Bly, we've gone inside the pages of The History of Exorcism. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to sophiainstitute.com, the website for its publisher, Sophia Institute Press. Or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app or wherever you download your favorite podcasts. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. 